All right, hello everyone. Welcome to AgriSource's webinar series. This is the first episode we're doing. Uh, my name is Dylan. I'm joined by Mike Carrigan and Dana Spaulding. How you doing, Dylan? Hey, Mike. Hey. Hey, guys. So, AgriSource has been in business since 1984. We provide organic waste management services to a number of different towns and cities. We work with a bunch of landscaping and construction companies. A uh, number of different horse farms, uh, golf courses, uh, just to name a few. Um, we have our own composting facility in Ipswich, and we also produce engineered soils at our soil blending facility in Middleborough, Massachusetts. Um, we also work with a number of other different facilities, and we help market their products to our customer base. So in the first episode today, we're going to be going over compost and the composting process. So what is compost and how it's made? Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Dana to go over more about compost. Great, thanks Dylan. All right, so starting out, we're gonna start out with the question, what is compost? So let's look at the definition as defined by the US Composting Council. Compost is a product manufactured through the controlled aerobic biological decomposition of biodegradable materials. The product has undergone mesophilic and thermophilic temperatures, which significantly reduces the viability of pathogens and weed seeds and stabilizes the carbon such that it is beneficial to plant growth. Compost is typically used as a soil amendment, but may also contribute plant nutrients. Okay, so let's break that definition down a little bit. What does this mean? Compost is a product manufactured through the controlled aerobic biological decomposition of biodegradable materials. So oxygen is used to break down biodegradable materials, such as leaves and grass or food scrap or other organic matter. The product has undergone mesophilic and thermophilic temperatures, which significantly reduces the viability of pathogens and weed seeds and stabilizes the carbon such that it is beneficial to plant growth. So the temperatures inside the compost piles are hot enough, but not too hot, which allows our microbes to work properly to create a product that's safe for use with plants. Okay, compost is typically used as a soil amendment, but may also contribute plant nutrients. So compost acts like a fertilizer, but it's not a fertilizer. And again, this is the official definition from the US Composting Council for the people who make the rules and regulations around compost and composting. So let's simplify a little. What is our definition of compost here at AgriSource? Compost is a product of decomposed organic matter, which has gone through proper time and temperature intervals, creating a soil amendment, which aids in the benefit of plant growth. When we start talking about compost, there's some terminology that we'll often use and you'll hear frequently as the discussion goes on. So our feedstock, this is our base material that the compost is made from. Our feedstock is also our nitrogen source for our compost. So things like leaves, grass, food waste, manures, or biosolids. Uh, the next thing we end, we'll talk about is our bulking agent or our amendments. This is the carbon source in our compost. This also helps to reduce um, moisture in our compost and helps to balance out our carbon to nitrogen ratio. Some examples of bulking agents or amendments, uh, wood chips, wood grindings, or sawdust. Okay, as we start to talk more about our carbon to nitrogen ratio, our browns versus our greens, we need to have a balanced carbon to nitrogen ratio in our compost to help plants grow and be safe for use with plants. So we don't wanna have too many wood chips or too many, too many browns or too little greens. We have to not have a good balance. Um, next, we'll start talking about organic matter. Okay, this is the broken down organic material. This both retains moisture and provides the nutrients. So your compost is turning into organic matter, to, which is gonna help retain moisture, provide nutrients. As we talk about these nutrients in compost, we're gonna talk about both macro and micronutrients, so your macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and then your micronutrients, boron, calcium, iron, etc. 
When we look again here at some examples of some feedstocks and amendments, um, so some let's go down the list a little bit. Some typical feedstocks or nitrogen sources for our compost. Um, one ex one good example is our leaf and yard waste. So grass and leaf clippings. Oftentimes these these will be turned into a leaf compost. Okay. Additionally, we'll see. Um, food waste being used as a feedstock. So where we're getting more homeowners, more restaurants and more schools are now adopting um, food waste recycling programs, that food waste can then be turned into a compost. Okay, another example of a feedstock that we commonly refer to as a biosolid. A biosolid is the residual product left over at the end of the wastewater treatment process this product can then be turned into a compost. Manures as well are another feedstock. Again, some typical amendments that we'll see are wood chips, our sawdust, our brush, and sometimes cardboard. So not all composts are the same. Uh, we have various feedstocks, we have various bulking agents and amendments, and those are um, combined in various ratios. So composts have similar properties, but not all composts are the same. Yeah, Dana, can you just quickly touch on the, the different kinds of compost that we that we work with? Yeah, that's a good question. So one of the one of the main types of compost that we we manufacture here at AgriSource would be our leaf compost. Um, our leaf compost <clears throat> is generated at our Ipswich facility, and the feedstock for that is our leaf and yard waste. Another type of compost that we, we work with here at AgriSource would be a biosolid compost. Again, our biosolids are created at the end of the wastewater treatment process. There's a residual or a biosolid. That product can then be composted. We add a bulking agent to that and compost it. So, those two different examples of types of compost we work with here. Now, not all composts are the same. So what are some of the differences? Um, things like moisture content. If we're looking at, say, a leaf compost, we generate our leaf compost. They're made outdoors. The facility is open air. So the, the compost is getting rained on, snow, um, takes on a little more moisture. If you're looking at like a biosolid compost, those are typically made in vessel or indoors. Okay, so those moisture contents can vary. Another thing that can vary between types of compost is the texture and particle size. So a half inch screened leaf compost, which is a little coarser, often being used just as a soil amendment or creating planting mixes, doesn't need to be as finely screened. Um, and then an example of a biosolid compost, compost will typically be more finely screened to quarter inch as it will be often being used in a top dress application. So the finer screening will allow it to go through top dress equipment more easily. Okay, and then other differences are our organic matter content levels, our pH, our soluble salts and our nutrients. All right, so why compost? Why are we composting? Composting is done to convert materials to a form that is more acceptable and easier to use. So we're creating something that's easier to use or reuse. Okay, by composting, we're able to reduce pathogens. We're able to eliminate weed seeds, any weed seeds that might be in that feedstock. Um, we're converting organic matter into a more stable form. So. When we do that, we're helping to reduce odors, we're reducing the potential for regrowth of pathogens, and we're also getting a more balanced carbon to nitrogen ratio, okay, which is gonna make nitrogen more available to plants. And as we're going into the next slide, Dana, what are the different benefits that each of the composts provide compared to leaf and, and biosolid? Yeah, sure. We can we can talk a little bit about benefits of both those composts in a couple of ways. Um, 
the benefits across the two are, are similar. Um, one of the one of the biggest benefits as we start talking about compost is to improve the soil's physical properties by adding organic matter or compost. So when we use compost um, as a soil amendment, we're increasing the water holder holding capacity of the soil. We're increasing the pore space in the soil and we're decreasing the bulk density of the soil. We're making a lighter soil. OK, so by increasing the water holding capacity in the soil, we're able to use less irrigation and less less water to irrigate, say, a lawn area. OK, when we increase the pore space in the soil, um, we're helping to reduce soil compaction. We're increasing the amount of air and water infiltration into the existing soil by increasing that pore space, which will again help decrease bulk density. So you have more air and water getting down into the soil versus running off and eroding. Next, when we talk about the benefits of compost, we can talk about the addition of nutrients and the improved nutrient holding capacity in the soil. So by using compost as a soil amendment, one of the biggest things we'll, we'll see is we will increase the cation exchange capacity. Okay, so what that means is we're increasing the soil's ability to retain nutrients. Um, so if those nutrients, if more nutrients can be retained in the soil, more nutrients will be available for uptake by the plant. That's a, a benefit of using compost. Okay, those nutrients that are uh, retained in that soil are now becoming available in a slow release form. And those nutrients that are being not available in the soil are going to help to reduce our overall synthetic fertilizer use. Okay, so again, using compost in our soil will help improve nutrient availability for plants. It will also help decrease nutrient loss via leaching. Um, because it's being provided in a slow release form, which is going to again improve plant growth and survival. Um, so, segueing into the benefits of compost, here we have some, we're showing some common uses or common ways that we see compost used. Um, looking at the top two slides, we have some top dress applications of so compost being used in an overseed aerating and top dressing application for uh, a golf course on our top left and sort of a typical uh, lawn on our on our right. Looking at the bottom slides, we see some other ways compost is used. We have some raised planters on the bottom left. So using compost in a raised planting mix in a 50-50 ratio, we're providing nutrients to those raised planters we're providing um, water holding ability of that soil. And we're, we're providing a, a soil that's also going to grain in a raised bed. Looking at the middle slide, we we see compost being used as a mulch. Um, again, compost being used as a mulch, it's going to help improve the soil profile as it breaks down. And it's also going to provide some nutrient to the plants. And then bottom right, we see a sort of a typical tree and shrub installation where we have compost being used as either a soil amendment for existing soil or we're generating planting mixes with ratios of sand, soil and compost for a particular specification for, for a tree or shrub planting. Um, and before we move on to the next part, Dana, how can you tell if the compost is or isn't being effective? What are the signs that people should be looking for? Yeah, that, that's a that's a good question, Dylan. Uh, sometimes one of the easiest ways to to know that your compost is being affected, let's say in a in a top dress application, if you've top dressed your um, a lawn area, typically inside of a two week period, you'll notice a real um, a real green up, you know, the lawn will be really green, really lush, and you'll be visually, you'll be able to see a difference. Um, likewise, in a in a planting application for trees and shrubs, or say a mulching application, 
you'll notice your your plants have a little more vigor, look a little more alive, not as not looking real sad or stressed out. Um, if you would just use like a, a nuts and bolts sort of soil that didn't have a lot of nutrient in it. So a lot of times it can be a visual thing just with plant health and leaves and vigor of the plant itself. All right, awesome. Thank you, Dana. Um, next, we're going to be going over the composting process. Um, so then I'll hand it over to Mike. Thanks, Dylan. Dana, thanks for the explanation of compost and what it is. So we're going to get a little further down the road on the actual composting process. So the composting process is the process of converting and recycling wastes, otherwise thought of wastes that we're now going to turn to something that's beneficial. We're looking to reach temperatures inside of our compost piles that are beneficial for thermophilic microbes. Uh, those are the ones that are doing the work to break down the, the organic content in there to make it into organic matter and make it to a finished compost. So typically we want to see between 35 and 65 degrees Celsius or 105 and 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Those temperatures are high enough and adequate enough to kill any kind of weed seeds or pathogens that are in the pile. You want to see around 55 degrees Celsius for three straight days to accomplish that goal. Uh, you want to make sure we don't get too high, say above 70 degrees Celsius, to where you're going to start slowing uh, the microbial activity or changing from thermophilic microbes to another population that aren't going to do the same work that you're looking for. And this is an aerobic process, like Dana said before, so it's under uh, the presence of oxygen and it's a control process. So you're actively doing this to create compost. This is not an active process. We've all seen this in somebody's uh, landscape yard or you know, golf course or even our own backyard to say, hey, I got, I got a compost pile out back. Essentially, it's just a pile of stuff that's decaying because it hasn't been moved. It hasn't brought air to it. It's not actively being processed. So this is not a compost pile. This is just decaying organic materials. So we talk about composting, the compost process, we call something called a process control. And basically what we're doing here is controlling the temperatures of the compost piles by introducing air or oxygen into the piles. Several ways to do this. One way is physically turning a pile or a windrow, which we'll talk about, is moving from one location to another, or it's introducing more air to the system. Another way is physically aerating piles or pushing air through a pile through a pipe. We'll get into this a little bit further. So there's a couple of methods. There's a windrow method, like we said, that is uh, long rows that are built with front end loaders, uh, typically somewhere between 10 to 15 feet high, 10 to 15 feet wide if you're on a commercial aspect. Those piles are then moved from one location physically to a next, which takes up the most land requirement, but it's got the smallest process control because all you're doing is breaking into the pile and letting the environment do the work. Second, we have an aerated static pile. So static meaning that it stays in one place. Basically it looks like a windrow, but underneath that windrow is a perforated pipe that then is attached to a blower that can push air through the compost pile. Process control here a little bit more since you now have the ability to turn on and turn off uh, the air and also change the volume that's running through it. Third, we have an in-vessel system. So this is the highest process control. It's more mechanized, it's done indoors. Uh, where you have blowers, you have odor control, you have everything run by uh, computers to make sure the system is working. And Mike, what's the method that we use at our Ipswich facility and maybe just highlight some of the other facilities that we work with as well and the methods that they use? Sure, so we, we have two methods that we use at our Ipswich facility. So in Ipswich, we're making leaf and yard waste compost and we use the windrow method for that. And we also make a biosolid compost and we use aerated static piles for the, com for the uh, compost of biosolids. A couple of examples of that you can see in this slide. So upper left hand corner would be a windrow method. You can see the long, tall piles of the compost mixture. As you can see, kind of down the row, they're starting to get a little darker in color as the material is breaking down. The row gets a little smaller because it's condensing as the material breaks down. It's physically picked up by a front end loader and moved to the next location. So as it's moved, that's where your air is introduced to it. In the lower left is a windrow turner. So still using a windrow system, you can't build them quite as big uh, because of the size of the machine. But basically this is a, a, an auger that runs through the pile and churns everything up, breaks up any clumps and clods and introduces air to the system that way. Again, fairly low on the process control. 
The next way up on process control, like we said, static aerated piles. Uh, bottom right is actually our Ipswich facility. Looks like general uh, windrows, but underneath those rows are perforated pipes connected to a blower system where air is physically forced up through those compost piles. And then we get to the, the highest process control on the upper right. So an in-vessel agitated bed system. So this is all done indoors. You can see some large troughs uh, filled with a compost mixture. In the walls, there's heat sensors. Underneath is a similar blower system to a static pile. And on top of those rails, there'd be an auger that drops in and can churn through to make sure everything's mixed um, nicely. So as soon as temperatures get too warm, the computer realizes that to the set point, kicks a blower on to start cooling it off, and auger will churn through to make sure things are nice and uh, agitated together. Quick example of building windrows. You'll see here, front end loader is picking up some compost from one windrow, moving it to the next one. Ramp up nice and high, try and drop to break up enough material. You see the steam coming off, which is actually moisture leaving the pile and it's not smoke. Similarly, here we have the pile in the middle, windrow, it's being broken out with the two new windrows on the sides. The front end of it is picking up, driving up, dropping, exposing that area. So air, oxygen, moisture. Quick diagram, diagram of a static aerated pile method. So as you can see here, there'd be a perforated pipe underneath and the windrow physically built on top of it. At the end, you're gonna have some sort of system for a blower or a fan to either push air into the pile or pull air out of it. So you have positive pressure going through, you have negative pressure pulling out. Uh, both ways work. Either way, uh, when you're doing a negative pressure, you can add an odor control element to it, where you have on the opposite end, if you put the end of the pipe into, say, uh, older compost or some sort of odor control system, you can then reduce some of the odors that could be coming out of a compost pile. So negative pressure, you can reduce that way. Positive pressure, it's pushing out up through the pile, less uh, odor control that you can do with that. Each way uh, works out great. A couple of pictures of static aerated piles, left-hand side, uh, under cover, helps to prevent any of the excess moisture from rainfall, uh, snowfall, outdoor elements. And the right-hand side, again, our Ipswich facility, uh, static aerated piles. An example of an in-vessel compost facility, facility. Uh, this is in Fairfield, Connecticut, one of the facilities that we work with. You can see on the lower right hand side looks like a mound of wood chips that's actually a biofilter which is a way to control odors the aluminum ductwork that's coming out of the building goes underground and allows the exhaust from inside the building to go through that biofilter um, allowing the odor to attach to the biofilter and not be put out um, into the environment so reduce some of the odors that's going on in there Take a look at the inside of the building. You can tell this is the highest process control that we have. You have some stainless steel walls. You have the, on the left-hand side, the aeration system. So small fans, doesn't take a lot of air. One to two pounds of pressure pushing through. Uh, those pipes go underneath into the troughs that we saw earlier to then blow through the piles. On the right-hand side is the exhaust. You can see those on the wall. That's what's pulling. It's very caustic environments, pulling the air through to then go through that odor control uh, to make sure that the, the neighbors are happy as well. So we're gonna run through the different parts of the compost process. It's a quick schematic and we'll, we'll look at this as we go through, um, starting with both the feedstock and the bulking agent and we'll work our way through. And I was talking about, we know what a feedstock is, being some of the nitrogen components. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the bulking agent. Um, so the bulking agent or the amendment helps to provide structure to the compost mixture. Actually also helps us um, increase our air movement through the pile. And it's a source of carbon, helps to absorb some extra excess moisture. So you can see here, typical wood grindings uh, being used. So we have our feedstock, we have our bulking agent, we're then gonna be mixing the two together. So we're in the mix phase. What's the purpose of mixing with some of the bulking agents to get good air pore space. Why do we want air-filled pore space? Composting is an active process. 
you need oxygen to compost. We don't have pore spaces filled with air. We don't have oxygen. We're not composting properly. So using good coarse material, some sort of bulking agent that then allows us to have nice air filled pore spaces. So air and oxygen are working through the pile, helping to break everything down. After it's been mixed, we are now in the active composting phase. And you'll see as you're active composting, these piles uh, can have temperature gradients where it's warmer in the middle of the pile versus the outside. This would be doing a standard windrow system. Same thing can happen with a static aerated pile. So center of the pile warm, outside of the pile starts to cool off as time goes on. And Mike, how are you able to tell that the entire pile is reaching the right temperature that you need? Yeah, great question. So in Ipswich facility, uh, we use a large thermometer. Basically, it's a three foot long because we know that the center of the pile is going to be the warmest. Uh, you push that into the pile and you check in temperatures every day. You want to make sure that those temperatures are reaching the points uh, to be doing proper composting. Since we know the outside of the pile is cooler than the inside, another reason why windrows are getting flipped. You want that outside that's cooled off to be put to the inside where it's going to warm up again and the inside that's starting to get too warm to be pushed to the outside. Similarly, in a static system, as the air is being pushed through, it reduces some of these temperature gradients because it's being moved around a little bit more. And then in vessels facility, when you have the agitator or the auger that drops in, churns everything together to make sure the entire pile is consistent. So during active composting, you're managing where the temperatures are during the pile. Active, active composting comes curing. So curing is a stage that follows active. You start to see your temperatures cool off. So in the bottom right hand graph, you can see in the active or thermophilic stage, active composting between 50 and 60 degrees uh, Celsius. As it starts to cool off in the 40 to 50 degrees Celsius stage, now you're in the curing. So curing is considered a uh, further breakdown. It's another way to drive off some more moisture from the pile. You might still be uh, utilizing thermophilic microbes at that point. So stuff is still breaking down. It's just starting to slow. It's starting to finish. Further drying is taking place and the compost is becoming safe to use. Next, we have screening. Screening can actually be done before curing, so after active composting and screened and then let cure, or you can let it cure and then screen it. Either way is okay. Uh, typically with an agrisource, we screen after we cure, but either way is fine. Purpose of screening is you want to make something that's more desirable to the end consumer. All that bulking agent, all the material that you put in in the beginning, it's time to come out. So if you have large pieces, you can screen. Typically, we see between a quarter of an inch and three quarter of an inch. Uh, for compost, those larger pieces are going to come out uh, the backside. We call them tailings or screenings, and that can actually be recycled. So we see in the, the chart schematic on the bottom, you can now take those screenings or tailings, bring them back to the beginning into the mix system, and now you have some more bulking agent amendment that you can run through the pile again. A few quick examples of different ways you can screen can be as simple as some chicken wire on a frame where you're physically pushing the compost through to get the big pieces out of it. Uh, in the top center, you'll see there's a, we call it a, a trommel screen or a drum screen where material comes in that upper left-hand chute. You can physically move it around by hand. Anything smaller than the screen size is gonna fall below, which would be your screen compost. Anything larger is coming out that bottom side. You can get uh, equipment, goes on the front of a front end loader, does a similar thing, yet physically scoops into it. And as you look on the bottom two, those are larger trommel screens, basically similar to the upper middle picture of a drum, just on a larger scale. You'll see this more with commercial composting, Hundred, hundreds of yards per hour can be produced uh, using this type of equipment. And now that it's been screened, it's time to store the material. Being in New England, uh, compost sales are not 12 months of the year. You'll see most of the material going out the door in the springtime, in the fall time, somewhat through the summer, uh, winter time, you need to store your material. So you want to make sure it's in an area that's protected from runoff or run on with too much weather coming onto it. If you can keep it covered, great. If not, keeping it in some sort of form of a large windrow or a cone that allows water to shed off of it would be great. It's best if you can move some of your oldest material first as you're adding to that 
pile during the storage time. And it's also great to test your material. One, make sure you don't have any pathogen regrowth, but you want to know those factors that Dana talked about earlier, organic matter, pH, nutrients, so you can pass those on to the end consumer. So now that you've had it stored, you're ready for distribution. That's how we run through the compost schematic. Dana did a great job explaining what compost was. Hope you got something out of the compost process as well. And Dana will, uh, Dylan will take us home. All right, so that wraps up the first episode of our webinar series going over the going over compost and the composting process. Um, big thank you to everybody who watched and also thank you to Dan and Mike for breaking everything down for us. Um, you can see our contact information on the screen here. If you got any questions about anything that we went over today, um, any comments or feedback, maybe maybe a topic that you guys want us to go over in another episode. Uh, I think in the next episode we'll probably go over more about the middle grower facility and the soil blending process and the different types of soils that come out of there. So that'll be on the way soon. Um, and with that, uh, again, thank you everybody for watching. And um, that's it from us. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.